Hello, everyone. Welcome. Esther and I are pleased to see a lot of men in the room, we decided. That's excellent. We applaud you. I'm Hannah Rosen. I was a writer for many years at The Atlantic. I now work at NP. I'm one of the hosts of NPR show Invisibilia. And I am here today to speak with the marvelous, fabulous Esther Perel, a person who has enlightened me so much on so many things. Um, Esther is the author of the best-selling book, Mating in Captivity, sort of about the modern marriage. She has an upcoming book about infidelity, which is one of the things we're going to talk about today. Um, her job that I'm most, most envious of is that she's a consultant on the show The Affair. Um, if any of you have seen it, it's, it's a brilliant show, and you're welcome to ask her about it after. She's also most recently a columnist for Cosmo, Lucky Cosmo. Um, she has a TED Talk that has been viewed like billion gazillion times by people all over the world. And she's also a working psychotherapist and writer. So any of you top that. Welcome, Esther. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm going to start this way. Because TED tends to be like look on the bright side-ish, they titled Esther's talk, how to maintain desire in long-term relationships, because that's the positive view. That was the first talk. The that was the of first the second talk. talk was less optimistic. Well, the less optimistic. The thing that the thing that the thing that Esther the the the, mo the intriguing subject that Esther is looking at right now is why do people in happy marriages have affairs? That's the more uncomfortable way of phrasing that same topic. So we're both going to talk about the affairs, but really we're going to talk about the nature of the modern egalitarian marriage. Fair? Fair. OK. Um, OK. So let me just say, that's a terrifying sentence. Someone in a happy marriage has an affair. That's a sentence that scares a lot of people. Can you, just by starting off, describe this couple? Doesn't, you know, a couple, it doesn't have to be an actual couple in your practice, but give me an example of the, of, of, of the man and the woman you see in this situation who come to see you. Or two men or two women. It okay. doesn't uh, have to be a heterosexual story. Um, well, what's their marriage the, like? <laughs> but what's their marriage like and what's the marriage like that they thought they had are two different things starts with that. Mm -hmm. So the marriage can be uh, a very warm, affectionate, companionate relationship. The marriage can be excellent teamwork. The marriage can be a great friendship. The marriage can be even still sexual. Um, the marriage may be functional. The marriage may be... Um, that would be the nice version of it. The lesser nice version of it could be that, um, but you want the happy people cheat version. So I think I want that version first because okay. that allows us to talk. I mean, it's the, right. it's the way we are smug about the modern companion right. marriage that is the thing that I it's find It's basically the marriage where you say that maybe if a person goes, you know, let me put it this way. If the first book was on what are the intricacies or the paradoxes of desire in modern love on the inside of a relationship, I would say that a book about infidelity is about what happens when desire goes looking elsewhere. And so then the question becomes, what makes one look elsewhere? Um, what makes one act upon it? Because the desire may be there in many people. And, um, and many times, it's not because you want so much to leave the person that you are with, as much as you kind of want to leave the person that you have yourself become. And sometimes it's not because you're going to look for another person as much as you're longing to reconnect with lost parts of yourself. And the notion of the unhappy relationships have affairs is a symptomatic view. If you have everything you want at home, there would be no reason to go looking elsewhere. Hence, if you've gone elsewhere, there must be something missing. And either there's something missing in you or there's something missing in the relationship. And so it's always a deficiency model, but millions of people can't all be pathological. So, okay, but do you think this is something particular? I mean, say that sentence again, because it's such a good sentence. You're not looking for something different, you're looking for a different version of yourself. Yes. So, so is that something particular? Is that a situation that we especially find ourselves in today? today? Yes. I mean, look, infidelity or adultery has existed since marriage was invented, and so too the taboo against it. 
So that is not new. But the meaning of infidelity has changed dramatically because the meaning of marriage has changed dramatically. But that's not your question. So we can come back to that. Like, so, for example, div why don't you just get a divorce? Right? Divorce is very common now. We live in an era in which it's extremely common to right. get divorced. But so. you're asking me, let's go, you've go, go asked me okay. three questions. So the first one is, um, why would happy people cheat? What does it mean when we say that, of course, affairs are about betrayal and deception and lying and secrecy, but they are also about longing and loss and that whole yearning aspect of it? And people have always had desires. What's different today in our consumer, individualistically oriented society is that we feel more entitled to pursue our desires. We feel more entitled to be happy we want it in marriage, and if we can't find it in our marriage, then we will go and find it somewhere else. That right, I have a right to be happy. Marriage used to be for the after, no, marriage, happiness used to be for the afterlife. You know, if you suffered well on earth, you could be, you know, rewarded later on. Then we brought it down to earth, and now it became an option, and now it's a mandate. And that level of, I deserve this. It would be a betrayal of myself if I didn't pursue that. That whole thing is what has given it another edge. Now, about why not divorce, that actually supports a lot of the idea of why do happy people cheat. If it's really bad, people typically will end it. It's that, in fact, many infidelities, and of course we have to define what we mean by infidelities, occur in relatively happy relationships. People are relatively content. If they were not, they would actually leave. They value a lot of things in their relationship, but there are certain things that are missing. And, you know, in my office, because there's multitudes of infidelities and transgressions, but in my office, you could say that a lot of the people I see have often been perfectly monogamous or sexually exclusive for decades. And one day, they cross a line that they never thought they would cross. And so you ask for a glimmer of what? Why would somebody risk losing everything? Everything they've built for so many years, just, it's never just sex. That's one thing we have to really begin to understand. So that changes the whole equation. And why don't we know much about it is because, you know, it used to be that divorce carried all the stigma. And today, divorce has been rather normalized. And it's infidelity that is the new stigma. Because it says you didn't find everything especially since you waited 10 more years to find the one. If you didn't find that, if you didn't find it, basically infidelity shatters the grand ambition of love. The modern love. Modern love, the romantic love. And so what's wrong with that idea that we want in our partner to find everything? We want our partner to be our best friend, to fulfill everything. What's the problem? I mean, that <laughs> seems lovely. My husband is here, so. <laughs> Uh, this is everybody but you. Yeah. <laughs> so is mine. <laughs> oh, come on. You know, romanticism, which has existed, I mean, really kind of rose at the end of the 19th century in, the, in its democratic version, is probably one of the most um, ardent ideologies that, that we are not able to topple. You know, um, somebody said, actually, Marty Klein, who's here one day, said, you know, if, uh, if Apple sold you a product that fails 50% of the time, would you buy it? But that's what happens to marriage, and that's what we're doing. So what happens in this romantic ideal is really, I think that for the first time in history, we want one relationship to give us all the needs that have to do with anchoring and rooting and a sense of belonging and continuity and stability, and predictability, and security, and safety, and that whole dimension of our life. And we say, I want the same person to also provide us the sense of novelty, and surprise, and unknown, and mystery, and awe, and transcendence. And I want the same person to be familiar, and to be new, and to be comfortable, and to be edgy, and to be predictable, and to be surprising. And we should fix this with Victoria's Secret, you know? <laughs> And of course, as you know, there is no Victor's secret. You know where the responsibility lies. <laughs> so, you know, we are asking, particularly because of the privatization of life, because of the diminishment of all the major institutions that we used to rely on for those needs, we are asking one person to give us what once an entire village used to provide. 
and relationships are crumbling under those expectations, but this thing has become really tenacious. Marxism has gone, communism has gone, but romanticism lasts. <laughs> But, but so what's an alternative? I mean, you hear people at the wedding, they say like, I, you know, I want my husband to be my everything. Transparency, I want to know everything about each other. I mean, these are the kinds of things you would hear at an American wedding in 2016. No, we know, know everything about each other, we're best friends. At an American wedding, it's worse. Um, <laughs> at an American wedding, I listen to the vows and I think in two months, <laughs> this whole castle in the air is going to crumble. It's impossible <laughs> what these people are promising each other. I mean, it, it just has reached an, uh, an apex of folly, you know. So, um, for example, for example, you will never again feel alone in your life. You will never feel dismissed. You will never feel unacknowledged. <laughs> you will never not be validated. Your point of view will forever be respected. Every tear will be by, wiped out by me. You will forever feel that you are beautiful and glowing. I, my desire for you will be unwavering. I mean, it goes on and on. <laughs> <laughs> Have you been at this wedding? <laughs> so, so what does a realist vow look like? <laughs> I will fall short many times. <laughs> I will disappoint you as much as I will at times surprise you. I will I, be just as lonely as I was. Today. <laughs> there will be times when I will suddenly kind of redeem myself and you will say, oh yes, there still is something. And other times when it will feel, I mean, I don't know. It's not like you predict bad news, but there, there is, you know, the notion that, that all the negative emotions, all the inner turmoil will no longer be there because you will have the benevolent present of this unabiding, passionately loving spouse who at the same time has to take care of every other aspect of life. And knowing, by the way, that in modern couples, we are spending a lot more time at work, a lot more time with our children, and a lot less time with each other. So, and the survival of the family today in the West relies essentially on the relative contentment of the couple. You don't have the religion, you don't have the excommunication, you don't have the divorce laws, just because I want it and because we are good enough together, a la Anthony Giddens, you know, pure relationship, we will stay together. So if you don't invest in the relationship, you basically destroy the family for the children for whom you have neglected the relationship. Can you slow down on the children one? Like explain how the modern way of child rearing plays into this phenomenon that you're describing. So, I think one of the ways, I, I study the nature of erotic desire, if you want. But I'm not studying sex. I'm studying desire because it is the organizing principle of what sustains relationship these days. It's not love. People may love each other very much and not desire each other. And since, you know, you've all been listening to how we want today in the era of experience, we want to immerse ourselves into something that is authentic, beautiful, purposeful, meaningful, and marriage is basically undergoing the same kind of philosophy. And that idea um, creates a desire. And so that you have a kind of a tension between love and desire, between what nurtures one and what fuels the other, and it's not always the same. I call this the erotic charge, or the, you know. Now, when you watch child-rearing modern couples, you will often see that it is basically eros redirected. So the children get languorous hugs, and the adults live on a diet of quick pecks. The children get the latest of fashion, and the adults wear clothes you barely remember the original color. And the children get play dates with novelty and new activities, and you have curiosity and imagination and playfulness and everything that makes you feel alive, which is really the definition of desire. And the adults often do same old and same old. And what you have is eros redirected. All the erotic energy, all the ingredients of what maintains that sense of aliveness, of, of curiosity, of vitality, of vibrancy, of renewal, that charge is basically relegated to the kids. So the couple basically deals with the leftovers. Okay, raise your hand if you're depressed. 
now. <laughs> no, raise your hands if you relate to what I'm talking about. Do you know what I'm saying? All right, so let's, how do women, and I, I, I'm interested, because I know you've been talking to a lot of men lately, so now we're doing a little gender stereotyping. I just did my first workshop only for men at TED. <laughs> so the women, who do you want to talk about, the women or the men? The women are looking for what the men both, are looking for. Both, I, okay. think, I think that um, we are all looking at relationships that reconcile this fundamental paradox between safety and adventure. We both want, in our relationship, to experience both two contradictory fundamental human needs. So I don't see a difference. I don't think women need more security and men are natural roamers. That's kind of really old cliche. Um, I think that um, women maybe, I could say, certainly if you understand female sexuality, get bored with monogamy much sooner than men. And that is something that is not often seen because we've always interpreted it as she's less interested in sex rather than she's less interested in the sex she can have. And she knows what turns her on and she knows what makes her feel secure. And she has always had to choose what makes her feel secure above what turns her on. But that's not the same as to say men you know, are naturally conquistadors and women are by nature domesticated creature. And for that matter, if that was the case, she wouldn't have to be locked up so many times in so many parts of the world. You know, if she's right. not going anywhere, why is she restrained everywhere? But I think that in every relationship, you will have, look, all of us live and grow up with a need for dependence and a need for freedom, a need for togetherness and a need for separateness, a need for security and a need for, for adventure. It, I think it's human nature. But each of us will come out of our history and our culture and our society with a different experience. Some of us will need more space and some of us will need more protection. And in every relationship you will find that there is one person that's more in touch, if you want, with the fear of losing the other and one person who is more in touch with the fear of losing themselves. And that's when you start to look at infidelity. So Did you understand that? No. There is one person who is more in touch with the fear of losing the other, i.e. the fear of abandonment, and one person who is more in touch with the fear of losing themselves, i.e. the fear of suffocating. It's the next bridge, and that's when you look at infidelity that people and didn't... Yeah. Because, because when I say that people go outside, not just because they want to leave what they have, but because they want to find aspects of themselves, they want to reconnect with a lost self, it is that person the one that is more likely to fear the loss of themselves is also often more likely to go and find parts of themselves elsewhere. It doesn't mean that the other person didn't have any thoughts, fantasies, or wishes to be with other partners, sexually or emotionally, but they wouldn't have given themselves the permission to do it. And what about the men? So you describe the situation of women in very interesting ways. What are you finding when you're talking to men? Um, what I find when I talk to men is not so many different things. I mean, I think, um, you know, let's start. I, I think that when men tell you, look, the one word that people all over the world will say to me when they talk about affairs, and I've just gone to Romania, Belgium, France, and Denmark, and that in itself was an interesting trip, and India just before, so I've got the cross-cultural uh, lens on me. Um, People say they feel alive. That's what they emphasize, is the sense of aliveness that they reconnect with. And that has less to do with sex as with feeling desired, important, special, noticed, seen. It's all of that. And that is no different for men and for women. Men will experience it differently. Maybe they'll have more, you know, in some way, they, they, you could say it's more sex, it's less emotional. I don't buy that division per se. But um, I think that Men have had the permission to just go and pursue sex in a way that women have not because there are still nine countries where she can be killed just for straying. So you bet that when she's going to do it, she needs a game, good reason. But if you leave her free and you give her a car, you will know what she really wants to pursue and maybe it's not that different from men. 
On the other hand, men may just as much get connected, fall in love, etc., etc. We know that within long-term relationships, straight relationships, desire of men goes down very gradually toward their partner, whereas the desire of women plummets much more sharply. That he actually is able to stay connected. And what he wants, typically in that domain, you know, the, the traditional man was happy to, be the, to have service. Service means that for most of history, sex in couples was about reproduction and a marital duty on the part of women. Today, we have for the first time a sexuality that is completely organized around desire. Just because I feel like it, for pleasure and connection. After 1.4 children, there's no other reason except that you like it and it makes you feel good together. Straight, gay, everybody, same idea. Monogamously or not monogamously, with others or just with one, that depends. And what the modern man wants, he wants her to be into it. He wants her to want it. He wants her to desire it. He doesn't want her just to do it to do him a favor or to keep him at home or to pacify him or to you know, get him to then do something that she wants him to do. He wants her to want it. The, the, the rhetoric of desire is everywhere. And mm -hmm. desire is to own the wanting. It's really linked to the sense of freedom and sovereignty that fits the modern society in which we live. You have it for every other aspect. It's no different in relationship, be it emotionally or sexually. What about the idea of who men are supposed to be? You know, how much they're supposed to be helpful, what it means to be a man, sort of the way we view men. Does that get in the way of things, do you find? Look, um, you know, I think that everybody understands that for the last 40 years, women have been thinking about themselves as women. What they want to be, how they want to do it, what is the connection with other women, what's the sense of solidarity among women, how can you collaborate and not compete, you know, what, what, how do we battle the cattiness of women, all of these things. And men have had no conversation. There's not been a conversation that allows men to rethink manhood and to rethink identity. And I think that this is what's going to happen now. And you see it politically with Brexit. You see it with uh, Trumpism. You see it, populism is often a, a, a movement of men who are disempowered, mm -hmm. since it starts with the economic crisis. And the economic crisis traditionally was a crisis around men. And that leads to a crisis of identity and a disempowerment and a disenfranchisement from the family, etc. The biggest gain of men, I think, in modern family the biggest gain is the invention of modern fatherhood. That fathers could no longer just be material providers, but could be actively engaged with their children as an emotional unit. But that said, men have to, uh, to have a whole conversation at this point. Sexually, how are we going to battle this notion that men are not biological creatures, you know, in perpetual motion, in search of an outlet, and that they are actually just as internally driven when it comes to sexuality as, and as, as anybody else. Their sense of self-esteem, their sense of depression, all of this will matter how they feel about themselves as men and sexually. You know, the word emasculated doesn't exist in the feminine. Neither, neither does the word loser for that matter. Men and performance and sex, those, that's a very particular triad. And so to deconstruct that triad will do a lot of good. And then to understand that, you know, the fear of rejection, the fear of inadequacy, and the mystery of not knowing what ex the experience is on the other side when the other side is a woman, very different between two men, are very internally driven experiences of men, psychological determinants that affect them sexually. And I'm tired that we think that women are subjective creatures that are very complicated, and male sexuality is some simplistic thing. 97% of studies on desire are on women because nobody ever assumes that it should be studied in men since it's a given that he should want it all the time, any time. And nobody speaks about the fact that after 55, a vast majority of couples who become sexless are driven by men because they are on SSRIs, prostate medication, hyper blood pressure, or, or uh, diabetes, and all of those have sexual side effects. And so there is this constant preservation of the idea that one side boasts and exaggerates and lies in that direction, and the other side diminishes, denies, and minimizes in the other directions. And in effect, everybody lies. <laughs> um, <clears throat> Jun, yeah. I have lost my voice. I hope you can hear me. <laughs> no, you sound me. great. Um, I want to do a little cross-cultural comparison. So 
in America, there's a certain language around affairs. There's a certain language of trauma, recovery, sin. There's a way we talk about affairs um, that I think you find unhelpful. I mean, when dealing with actual people, you find unhelpful. That there's a certain conversation about affairs that's not being had. Right. Can you talk a little bit about the American idiom yes. of affairs? Yes. So. Um, the State of Affairs, which is the book I'm writing, is really about creating a new conversation. Because I think if I was to ask you, how many of you have been affected by infidelity in your life? Can you raise your hand? It's just affected by infidelity. You could have been the child, the brother, the sister, the receiver, the doer, the third person in the trial, whatever. A, it's a systemic thing. Raise your hands again. How many of you have been affected? And look around. Voila. But the conversation does not include any of this. The conversation is kind of simple categorizations of black and white and good and bad and villain and victim and perpetrator. And that's the language. It's a criminalizing language. It doesn't help anybody. You understand that infidelity is going to become a major subject in your elections because, and I just became American, I'm going to vote Woo! for the first time. <laughs> um, you know, because the woman that is in the candidate is resented by many and for having chosen to stay. And choosing to stay when you can leave is the new shame. The new shame. That's the new secret. And that language basically kills f families many times that were perfectly good families or even marriages that needed to end. But that doesn't mean that the entire marriage is now a fraud and the whole thing is a lie because this truth stands to reverse everything else that was accomplished for the preceding 28 years. And furthermore, to think of infidelity as the most severe, Americans, 91% believe that infidelity is worse than cloning, than suicide. I mean, it's, it's become like the, the worst of betrayals and violence. And I, it's, you know, contempt, indifference, neglect. There are lots of other relational betrayals that are not just about infidelity. But they are no longer getting much currency. This has become the one and with the leading cause for divorce. And that actually is not different in France or Denmark or Romania, but for completely different reasons. That's what's interesting. So I think it needs to be a language that doesn't hold judgment in its bosom because the fact is you can judge it as much as you want. It doesn't make it go away. It has a tenacity that marriage can only envy. <laughs> you know? Um, and so what is the right model? The right model is a dual perspective model for me. It's a model that understands what it did to you and also what it meant for me. It's a model that holds at the same time the experience of betrayal, breach of trust, deception, shattering of reality, and at the same time longing, yearning, renewal, you know, um, opportunity that people never regret for that matter, even if they feel terribly guilty about having hurt the other person. They don't necessarily always feel guilty for the experience itself. But you need um, a dialogue, basically, in which you, you, you go through the, step, the steps that involve relationship repair and rebuilding of trust, and sometimes that trust afterwards becomes what is often called a secondary naivete, not the first naivete in which you somehow believe that this would never happen to you. You know, Americans don't cheat any less than the French. And I have a French accent, but I am not French. And they just feel more guilty about it. It's very, it's very, the, the statistics are just about the same. And they feel more guilty about it because the, because the pursuit of pleasure in and of itself, not just sexual pleasure, is clashes with Puritanism. And so, so you're doing it all the while you say, I do something wrong. It's like when you go to a restaurant here, no matter how fancy the restaurant, and you're having this fantastic meal, out while the while you're talking about how you shouldn't be eating these things. To us, it kills the whole meal. <laughs> but it's as if the kind of the moral imperative is right next to the pursuit of pleasure. <laughs> So the right model for me is a model that is more humane, that is more compassionate, 
that makes room for the fragility of human heart, that looks at infidelity as a window into the limits of marriage, that looks at infidelity as a window into the crevices of the human heart, and that encompasses the myriad of experiences that have to do with love, lust, trust, and commitment, and not some perpetrator, victim, criminalized, um, uh, shaming, isolating experience that is wrong for the whole clan, not just for the two people. It's a systemic thing, and it's intergenerational as well. And if we looked at this, I mean, the, the panel is called The Future of Marriage. I always want to take this one step further. If you looked at it, then what? I mean, what can you do? What, what, how can you change marriage? What can you do to Oh, it? but marriage has changed all the time. Marriage used to be an, an economic enterprise. And in fact, adultery was the space where people went to look for love. Because marriage was too mercenary an enterprise to have to bring love into it. Then we brought love to marriage. And now infidelity is the shattering of that love. Now marriage is a romantic arrangement in which I want the same person to be my best friend, my trusted confidant, my passionate lover to boot, and you live twice as long. So, you know, um, and the future of marriage is a marriage that is, it continues its evolution. Not too long ago, premarital sex would have been an, a, a, a total sin and, and, an, and, 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 a, and, a, and a cross on you for the rest of your life. Then we brought premarital sex, normal, contraception, normal, um, gay marriage, now normal, uh, sexuality, um, the homosexuality taken out of the DSM, you know, in the 70s, finally normal, um, and the borders keep being pushed. Then we wanted a sexuality within marriage that was a sexuality that was connected, emotional, sexual, satisfying, luscious, you know, with all of that, and now we're talking about a sexual freedom within marriage. And that is going to become the next conversation. Look, monogamy used to be one person for life. Today, monogamy is one person at a time. <laughs> and everybody goes around saying, I'm monogamous in every relationship. <laughs> you know, um, people, I, uh, there's no monogamy in your memories, and there's no monogamy in your fantasies. So the only place you have monogamy is in reality, and that's a rather small portion of your consciousness. You know? And, Mar marriage used to be when you started to have sex for the first time, and now marriage is supposed to be the place where you stop having sex with others. And for some people that's true, but the model has been proclaimed monogamy and clandestine adultery. That's what people have done forever. Now come the young generation, and they say, enough with the lying, let's have transparency, Let's take this idea of self-fulfillment and freedom and self-actualization that we want in our life and in our relationships and apply it also to our sexual contracts. And let's begin to think about ways that we can preserve sexual freedom within a committed primary relationship, like many gay couples have done for a long time and from whom we have a lot to learn. But don't you think that... And that would redefine monogamy, by the way, not as sexual exclusiveness per se, but as a relational contract in which sexual exclusiveness can or cannot be a part of it that affirms a primary emotional commitment to a relationship. That's a whole other definition of monogamy. But monogamy has changed. By the way, monogamy had nothing to do with love forever. It was an imposition on women by men for patriarchy to know whose children you should feed and who gets the cows when you die. It's or the goats, or the camels, whatever the gender, the culture. This is a very new definition of monogamy. That this means, you know, you are so special to me that I will never need to look left or right anymore because even if I think about someone else when I'm with you, it means that you're not everything. And this inflated sense of self, and then the loss thereof when there is a betrayal, has made infidelity no longer just painful, but traumatic. I feel like that view is easier said than done and minimizes, <laughs> minimizes the power of sex. I mean, it says like, oh, it's fine. We'll just make a contract. You're my primary emotional partner. We'll have sex until we're, we're, we're bored. And then we'll go, like, who, really? Like, to, you know, I feel like this is just a problem without an easy solution. I think this is a, a, a how would I say, a dismissal of the intense search 
and quest that people who value the sexual expression as a fundamental expression of their life get embark in. The people who live that life or that choice are actually diligently thinking about these subjects and are often way more honest with their partners than the majority of the population that has been sneaking around for millennia. Honest is one thing, but one of the partners is holding the power usually. Not necessarily. The power is also in, you have power in every relationship in multiple ways, including from the bottom up. You know, it's not just from the top down. Power is intrinsic to relationships, all relationships, certainly love relationships. Every relationship where you depend on somebody has power. Power is not a dirty word. It's a very complex, intricate element. And it's not true that it's always one person who wants and not another. But all I'm saying is that by definition, it becomes the next frontier. It's what you're watching. You can see words emerge in a culture that didn't exist 10 years ago. You can see in the therapist's office pre presenting situations that you didn't see 20 years ago. And you start to begin to see the beginnings, the inklings, the embers of a social change. Not that I'm advocating any of this. What I am advocating on the future of marriage is this. You can't have a one-size-fits-all in which the only time you know it's successful, like Dan Savage often says, is when people show up at a funeral parlor at the same time. That it's only when death do you apart, when everybody knows at this point that it ends when love ends. Of course, I think love is a flimsy thing on which to build a marriage. But I also know that until now, you have a one model. And if you don't fit it, there's something wrong with you. Or your marriage. Never with the model, yes. And I think that in some way, the divorcees or the, the, the pursuers of divorce are maybe the true idealists because the model never gets questioned. It just says, maybe I chose the wrong person and I'll do better next time. But the model is intact. And the life that we live today, the, because it is so personalized and privatized and every of the big choices that used to be made for us by religion, by our parents, by the institutions that regulated our lives, are now on us. We need relationships that can encompass this complexity, and it needs to be multiple models. There's not going to be a, a one-size-fits-all. And that in itself will do good to marriage. So the way that's liberating is, let's say you have a marriage that lasts six years, 10 years. It was a successful six-year or 10-year marriage. You don't have to consider yourself or your marriage a failure. Yes, I think that the notion that a marriage that ends is a failed in relationship is damaging and untrue and makes people re be revisionist of their entire life and then pass on to the next generation a narrative that is unfortunate and not true. Not true. For some it is, but that, that's not the one we talk about. Well, I think the idea that it can end because of a multitude of reasons and that what happened during those years has been very important. I see marriages where people helped each other through illness, buried their parents, helped each other with disabled children, helped each other with economic downturns, built their homes together. And then, because it ends for whatever the reasons, it's a failure. It's, it's, they've done good marriage. They've done good by what marriage expects us to do. When I say marriage, I mean committed relationships. It doesn't just have to do the marriage. Um, in your travels, have you seen elements of this in other countries, things that you think that people in other countries do better or worse than we do? Exaggerations of the American experience, improvements on the American experience? Oh, la, la. Um, we'll take one country at a time. I mean, who, who do you want to talk about? In, India, Denmark, or uh, where was the third I'll one, Romania? The, yeah, the, com the, yeah. the thing that, that uh, uh, occupied me in the last few weeks was really this comparison between Romania and, um, and Denmark. Because Romania probably was one of the steepest of the communist countries. Ceausescu was rather open on the outside, but he was a gruesome dictator on the inside. And, um, <clears throat> and by the way, sex, in, co in communist countries was the only form of individual freedom. It was really the way that you bucked authority. It was the one thing that the, the party couldn't control. And so infidelity and transgression and decadent parties and all of that that occurred under communism was really an assertion of individual freedom and power and sovereignty and all of that. Romania today still primary mode of contraception is abortion. 
At one point, I talked about, you know, when you give birth and the men you will be in the room with your wives and your girlfriends, <laughs> they looked at me like, you know, no, 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 these people go for surgeries with people in white um, clothes, and the guys all sit in one room and they hear 10 women scream and they just wonder which one is theirs. <laughs> and I'm thinking, oh my God, don't make assumptions ever, no assumptions whatsoever. And I knew that the conversation with the 600, whatever, 50 people in that room was a first, a first, that as a society, people came together, people drove hundreds of kilometers to come and have a conversation about the state of relationships. You know, at one point I talked about infidelity and I asked about affected, and then there was like a group of 20 people that just began to talk about how they were illegitimate children, you know, and then of course the question was, were they the children of a betrayal? Were they the children of a love story? And many of them found out, you know, secrets, secrets, intergenerational secrets. You know, the parent dies, finally the parent, the other parent tells you, you're not really, the father wasn't really the one you thought, it was actually his best friend, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, everything that every novel has been made of. But then you go to Denmark and you say, here is a society, probably one of the most egalitarian in Europe with Sweden, in the world, I would say, and all the stressors that besiege American marriage have been cleared up. Maternity leave, check. Paternity leave, check. Affordable childcare, check. The state takes care of everything. There's no babysitting in Denmark. They don't have it. Um, free education and free health. And the, the rate of divorce is like off the roof. And so is infidelity. And then I began to think, and I kept asking them, why, why? You have nothing that makes everybody else miserable in marriage, <laughs> or Americans as they come tell to me. What's going on with you? And then I began to think about this, you know, the egalitarian high investment parenting where, you know, you go, you bake your own organic bread, you go and you get the avocado off to your tree, you know, and, uh, and, and you have this androgynous situation where, you know, Denmark has a, a very sharp decline in sperm count that they have been figuring out for the last 15 years. And you don't know why, but, you know, if women get their hormonal systems changed by and have more oxytocin when they carry the snuggly all the time, why would that not happen to men? In any case, the roles are very androgynous and very interchangeable. And the kind of child-rearing culture is such high investment parenting that the relationships become de-eroticized. They are great teams in desexualized relationships, and that's when you begin to understand infidelity. It's a completely different story than the Romanian story. It's simply that side of them has no space in the domestic that they have created. And I, I mean, there's many other things I've been So where do we go? To, uh, to Romania write or Denmark? Which one do we I choose? I don't think there is a... Uh, <laughs> a perfect model. I don't there. think there is a perfect model. I mean, I think, I think that what you see... You know, the interesting thing about Romania is that I was there the last time 10 years ago when, and then before that in, in 79, in the heights of Ceausescu, and you could just kind of see what happens when urbanization occurs. People move to the city. They went from eight children to 1.8 children in 20 years. They're doing in 20 years what the rest of Europe did in 100 years. And you, you see a kind, of a, a kind of a cultural collapse of social forces. For the first time, the concept of happiness enters their life. Marriage used to be, basically, you choose. Maybe you choose not well, bad luck. At least you can be lucky, you die sooner. You know? <laughs> This is, there was, it was glo gloom, it wasn't, love stories ex existed somewhere else, but marriage was not a place where you went to look for, for, for those aspects of yourself. The family mattered. And by the way, why I began this whole story was like, you know, after the Clinton scandal, and because that is linked to the cultural thing, when the whole Lewinsky-Clinton um, scandal occurred, it was very interesting to me, why was America so comfortable with multiple divorces and so intransigent with transgression. The rest of the world has always opted the other way around, thanks to women. You preserve the family and you let the adult messes, you know, stay in their own little corner because there are too many people who depend on this marriage. The marriage isn't just between two individuals. And 
every time people would scream about affairs, I would say, why don't you scream about divorce? That the solution of all the family bonds with many longer consequences, except in Denmark, because the state takes care of you, you can divorce easily, and then you have a seven-day, seven-day model. But here, it was an interesting thing why this one has become so normative, and mm -hmm. this one is, the, is, is like the biggest offense, mm -hmm. and that is different. So what's the difference culturally? I think is that it's happening everywhere. That's not the point. But other places maybe yield a little bit more to, re, to the reality. There is less of, an, of a moral tinge to it. The notion that because you have lied here, that means you are, you are untrustworthy everywhere else. That is a very local idea here. Mm -hmm. Like, if I can't trust you here, I certainly can't trust you in any other aspect. You know, the fact that you may have asked questions that invite lying, that is never considered. The fact that honesty isn't about confession, but it is sometimes about preserving a person's honor in their community, that is a very different definition of the concept of honesty. Here, people believe in intimacy is transparency. In other places, Intimacy comes from the ability to actually preserve a certain opaqueness and a certain mystery. And that piece I would actually want Americans to study from the French. All right, we're going to open up for questions because we only have 15 minutes left. Anyone want to ask the microphone? Yes, in the hat, please. You know, in other subjects, everybody instantly raises their hands. <laughs> this one Don't demands be shy. A, a warming up. <laughs> yes. just, just start every question with my friend, and then it's over. Yes. <laughs> no, I just... So I know someone. You yeah. talk about affairs. There's a physical, sexual affair, but there also can be an emotional affair. You know, how do you see the differences? I mean, there, there's attractions that can be a connection where someone shares information about themselves and it's a place to connect, but there's right. no sex. And then there's also the physical. So I'm very glad you asked the question. I actually, um, for me, when I have to come up with a workable definition around what is an affair, I would say it has three constitutive elements. Is that me? No. Okay. Maybe. <laughs> three constitutive elements. Go ahead, try again. Hello. Yeah. Um, one is secrecy, which is really at the heart of an affair. It is the organizing element in terms of the experience and the titillation and the, and the seclusion of it and the specialness of it and in terms of the hurtful, crippling, gutting aspect of it, both sides. Second is sexual alchemy. And alchemy is the key word. Because the kiss you can only imagine giving can be as powerful as hours of actual lovemaking. The erotic is not sex. The erotic is, our, is the poetics of sex. It's our ability to imagine it. We have the ability to make love for hours, have multiple orgasms, blissful time, and touch nobody, just because we can imagine it. So I don't make a distinction in this notion between what is sex and what is emotional. And the third is an emotional involvement to one degree or another. You know, um, as Proust would say, it's our imagination that is responsible for love, not the other person. <laughs> so I think that today there is this new concept that has emerged that is called an emotional affair, which is a very interesting concept because it actually has emerged on the basis of the idea that in, if intimacy has become paramount and it means into me see and it is linked with transparency, then you're sharing important aspect of your interiority with somebody else becomes a betrayal. Rather than maybe that's what's necessary to support this little unit of two people and not that it is depleting it. That, you know, I often think, by the way, on the gender front, that many men, if they knew what their women partners tell their best friend, they would often think that there is an emotional affair. They would be gutted by the betrayal of what is actually being said about them, that they have no idea. So the notion of sharing intimate material with other people is an element of social living. The idea that that should be um, an emotional affair because it belongs to me. You owe me that. 
You owe me to share with me what you're thinking, what you're feeling. I have a right to your inner life today. That is part of the concept of, uh, of the privilege of intimacy at this point. I think that um, when you talk art, movies, books, I mean, here in Aspen, I'm sure lots of people have had wall, powerfully erotic conversations with other people that are not sexual, but they are massively erotic because they make you feel alive, charged, important, focused, present. And all of that is what is sexual, not, you know, sex, this, whatever rubbing that goes on. You know, is it the, the definition of infidelity and of what is sex keeps on expanding, you know? Are we talking just about, you know, the traditional penis entering a vagina? Are we talking about what happens between two men? Are we talking about a chat room? Are we talking about staying secretly active on your dating app? Are we talking about a lap dance? Are we talking about a happy ending? Are we talking about watching porn? I mean, it is just infinitely elastic, this thing. And that's why there is no research because nobody can agree on what is sex, actually, nor where does infidelity, you know, locate itself. And at the end of every study, it says, we need more research on the definition. <laughs> yes, over here in the scarf. It sounds like the way you're talking about the evolution of marriage, you really are saying that the next stage is polyamory, right? No, the next stage is multiple styles, of which polyamory will be one in a group of 15. Really, no, there is not, if it's to replace one thing with one other thing that is equally rigid, no, and that only suits half the population, that's not a corrective measure. The corrective measure is to understand that the personal domain today has become so central to our life, it's the one the, the, in which we are coming to looking for the biggest answers of the big questions of our lives in ways that we've never turned to the personal realm to do so. So there will be many. Are you saying that there's a way in which one needs to make room again for the village? Absolutely. Okay. That's, yes. Okay. And I think that polyamory, in that sense, is a recreation of a new kind of village. But it is a form of community for those who live it. But I think you can live community in multiple ways. Yes, I think that isolation is crippling. I think that most modern couples suffer from excess isolation. Women sometimes talk to women. Men in straight relationships often talk to nobody. And, um, and, and everybody thinks that it's better somewhere else. Um, and the subject of sexuality is the least people will talk about. And I don't think it does good to the survival, not just of the couple, but of the family, and therefore of the community. I think one thing that I have found um, sort of confusing is this notion, this confusion, I think, between marriage and commitment. Because, there, because marriage comes with a lot of other baggage, right? Social baggage, cultural baggage, and so on. But are they really that different? I mean, is there something there that would be helpful to kind of, is there something about the nature of commitment that can be rethought? I think that commitment, look, we have gone from, a, uh, uh, from relationships that were governed. This is true in all aspects of relationship, not just um, intimate, adult intimacies or family life. We used to have systems of relationships that were governed by duty, obligation, loyalty, and the needs of the collective. This was true in the, end, the larger economy as well. Today, your loyalty doesn't mean too much. There's no reason that suddenly it should just mean a lot with this one person you marry, when everybody else, when you're no longer disp you know, useful, can, you, know, you can be dispensable. It's permeating every social structure. So we've moved to a model of individualism and free choice with all the sometimes crippling elements of free choice because it comes with, you know, nobody wants to give up on the free choice and on the playfulness and novelty and freedom that comes with it. But it also brings uncertainty and self-doubt and dread. People used to marry because, people used to divorce because they were really unhappy. 
Today they divorce because they could be happier. And that is a very different definition of commitment. The commitment has to fulfill my needs. If I have the option, the reason the, the, the Danish model is interesting is because it's a country of middle class, mas o menos, more middle class than anywhere else. You know, um, when, when communism was up, 97% of the divorces were initiated by women, easily. <laughs> there was no, you, were, you didn't lose economic, in the, you know. So um, commitment today is not about my responsibility to others. Commitment today is a battle between my responsibility to others and my responsibility to myself. We have time for one more question. Yes, up in the front here. Or you want to, here, you, you ask. We've had over here, this man in the blue shirt. You're very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> so I grew up in a very unconventional world. Um, in Europe, son of, I'll say it as it is, playboy. Um, and infidelity was on every level of my growing up. And over time, I came to explain it away, or, or explain it as, um, you know, biological expression. And by that, I mean, I don't think that we as humans are programmed biologically to be monogamous creatures as defined in the normal sense of monogamy, not, not as you said, you know, emotional monogamy, or what did you call it? Um, yeah. I'd like to hear your thoughts on the evolutionary or biological expression or, or, or so evolutionary anthropologists and psychologists will tell you that we have basically forever practiced a dual reproductive strategy, social monogamy and sexual promiscuity. That's the model that actually has been used. But the question of are, is, are people by nature monogamous? Some are. Monogamy is a cultural, social, economic, and political structure. It's not about human nature. Any culture that imposed monogamy didn't do it because they looked at you or anybody else here and said, what is human nature? They said, what does the system need to preserve its powers, its privilege, its children, its authorities, and all of that? You know, the, the conversation about monogamy is, and, and human nature, are, to me, are two separate stories. By the way, so is the conversation about infidelity and the conversation about monogamy. There's plenty of infidelity in open relationships because sometimes, even when we have the freedom to express ourselves in other places, there is something about breaking rules that is really part of human nature. We are transgressive by nature. That gives us a feeling that we are really doing what we want when we're doing what we're not supposed to. So that's, that to me, do, you have to divide. Looking at the subject of infidelity, its pains and its quests is one thing. Looking at the subject of monogamy and what it means today and where it is evolving, it's a continuum. And it has always been redefined and it is being redefined again. Um, and more on an individual subjective level. But what happens, and maybe this is a way to, to end, is that unfortunately, because of the romantic idea that once you find the one, it is the one. And since you have 15 years of nomadism preceding it these days, that the one is invested with such an enormous amount of assets that I lost my train of thought. I was going to something. You talked about, ah. I think I can finish that sentence. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, tell me where I was going. You were going to, since the one is invested with so many assets, we've just put ourselves in a bind where we've, no. No? But I can't remember it. I have uh, a question for you and how you grew up. Was there pain associated with that, yes. that, that kind of upbringing? I mean, you were talking about, I did not think you were going to go to human biology. I thought your question was going to end with, I grew up in a situation with a lot of infidelity, and in that situation, we, the children, suffered. No. All right. <laughs> um, 
I think that there was probably points of suffering, and I think there was probably suffering for both parental partners mm -hmm. at times. Um, but I think it was more when, when there was risk involved. I think that for the bigger part, the, the intimate or, or the emotional relationship remained intact, mm -hmm. um, to use your term. Um, when that was threatened, that's when pain was felt. Got it. And I think that then the pain trickled down to being experienced throughout mm -hmm. the, the relational experience. So I think that today, most people in the West are gonna have two or three relationships, adult relationships, and some of us are gonna do it with the same person. Sometimes, when there is an infidelity, it requires real relational repair. But betrayal runs deep, but it can be healed. And for some people, this will actually mean that their first marriage is over. And maybe this is the opportunity to have a second one with each other. Well, that's a beautiful thought. Thank you, Esther. Thank you. And thank you all for coming.